Thank you all so much for being here, for devoting your Saturday to spending with um, this amazing exhibition celebrating this publication. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna have a great time today. So uh, welcome to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. I am Anna Marley, and I am Chief of Curatorial Affairs and the Kenneth R. Woodcock Curator of Historical American Art. So I would like to start out by recognizing that we are located here in Lenape Hoking, the unceded homeland of the Lenape peoples. Due to ongoing colonization and land theft, many Lenape peoples, languages, and cultures um, have, uh, sorry, um, many Lenape communities currently live in diaspora outside of this homeland. Lenape and other indigenous peoples, languages, and cultures continue to thrive in Lenape Hoking and beyond. And PAFA is committed to tangibly and actively supporting Lenape and another, other indigenous artists, cultures, sovereignty, and presence through our ever-developing exhibitions, residencies, programming, policies, and curriculum. We invite everyone who engages with us here to honor these living communities and work alongside us to foster ethically responsible futures in the American art world. Today, we are here to celebrate the wonderful life, art, and legacies of John and Roshonda Roden. And we are located here in the John and Roshonda Roden Amphitheater. Um, so it's thanks to them that we have this beautiful um, uh, auditorium. Thank you to all of our speakers who traveled from near and far to be with us today. So it's my pleasure to thank uh, uh, many of the uh, foundations and supporters who made this uh, exhibition and particularly this catalog possible. So determined to be the sculpture of John Roden would not be possible without the generosity of several supporters. Lead support and artwork for the exhibition was provided by the estate of Rashonda Roden. Major support is provided by the Terra Foundation for American Art, the William Penn Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Additional support is provided by the Wyeth Foundation for American Art and donors to PAFA's Special Exhibitions Fund. Lead support for the exhibition catalog, which is remarkable, was provided by the Henry Luce Foundation. The organization and digitization of the John Roden archives at PAFA was made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I first want to congratulate the brilliant Dr. Brittany Webb for five years of work with our collections, archives, and exhibition team for making this exhibition and book possible. So none of those uh, funding sources just landed in our lap. Uh, it was due to um, greatly articulated and well-crafted grant work and application. Um, and, and Brittany was the lead on all of that. I also wish to thank our publication manager for this project, Amanda Sparrow, who's up here from Maryland. Hey, Amanda. Uh, for her amazing oversight on this publication. And it's so great to have Amanda back working with PAFA. She worked with us in 2012 uh, for the Henry Oswa Tanner catalog as well. So she's part of our family here. Um, I would also like to thank Lori Wasselcheck, Han McCoy, and Brittany Webb for their organization of this day's events. Now, I would like to welcome Lori to the podium to begin our afternoon. And as I do, I want to say, Happy birthday, Lori. <laughs> Can I get a happy birthday, Lori? Happy birthday! <laughs> All right, thank you. I wish, yeah. Thank you so much. My name is Lori Wasselchuk, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programming here at PAFA. I feel like official when I say this. Today we have gathered to celebrate the incredibly, deeply moving exhibition and stunning catalog edited by Dr. Brittany Webb, determined to be the sculpture of John Roden. Sahar Costin Hardy creates images that highlight urban and ecological design, the built in environment, and people. With over 20 years of experience behind the lens, she seeks to tell stories through her imagery, 
focusing on important narratives by weaving together architecture photography, portraiture, and street photography. Sahar received a BFA in 2005 from the Tyler School of Art and Architecture, and she has lectured frequently on landscape architecture photography and visual storytelling. Recently, her work has been published in Landscape Architecture Magazine, Architect, Oprah Daily, and the New York Times. Sahar's other publications include Garden as Art, Beatrix Ferrand at Dumbarton Oaks, edited by, oh boy, Tasia? Tasia. Tasia Wade. And XX Miller Prize, Centering Women's Stories Through Portraiture, co-authored by Rihanna Sinclair for Active Landscape Photography, Diverse Practices, edited by, edited by Anne C. Godfrey. Costa Hardy's collaborative projects have received national recognition, including a Woman Photograph Plus Nikon Grant and a Gold Excel Award from the Association of Media and Publishing. Sahar is represented by Esto Photographics and a member of Diversity, Diversify Photo and Women Photograph. Edgy Joseph is a Philadelphia-based gaffer and lighting programmer working primarily on commercials, feature films, and episodic television shows. A former student of Drexel University's cinema and television department, Ed has a wealth of experience working in various roles on set. Notable projects include Mayor of Easttown, Concrete Cowboy, Free Meek, 21 Bridges, and Hustle. Dr. Brittany Webb is the Evelyn and Will Kaplan Curator of 20th Century Art and the John Ronan Collection. In this, web, in this role, Webb oversees PAFA's collections, exhibitions, and programs of 20th Century Art. Webb's first exhibition at PAFA, Taking Space, Contemporary Women Artists and the Politics of Scale, was co-curated with Jody Throckmorton, the former curator of contemporary art here at PAFA. Before joining PAFA, Webb was a member of the curatorial staff of the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Shout out to Anne. She holds a PhD from Temple University, and if Nina was here, she would say TU, <laughs> and from the University of Southern California. Under Dr. Webb's leadership, with tremendous support from a mighty PAFA st museum staff, John Roden's artistic legacy is in loving and dedicated hands. We couldn't be prouder of Brittany, and so let's welcome her to the podium. Thank you, um, and welcome. I thought we could start with the panel on the photography for this gorgeous catalog, um, so I am super excited to have Sahar Kostan Hardy and Ed De Joseph with us to talk about that a bit. Um, I'm actually gonna hop down from the podium and join them for a conversation. Welcome and thank you. <laughs> um, we're running a little late, so I wanna just jump right in. Um, could we talk a bit about how all of this came together, and to start, I want to mention that you know we started with a test photography day um, just to see what photographing 70 sculptures in at least three media and about four different size ranges would look like for this publication. So can we talk a bit about what you learned on that test photography day? Sure, absolutely. So thank you for having us here today first. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to do a test run is because I'm actually um, part of my practice, most of my practice has been photographing urban design and portraiture uh, as of late, maybe 15 or so years, but in a previous life I did photograph and work in the um, Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and, and I did a lot of retouching there and um, I, you know, kind of got my feet wet and started uh, started photography uh, as a professional practice there. However, it had been more than a decade that I had photographed uh, sculpture. <laughs> I was used to using the sun and clouds as my diffuser, Ed. Um, so, so photographing large scale urban design and parks and gardens is very, is very different than photographing uh, an entire life's work of sculpture. Yeah, could you talk a bit about what we're, what we're looking at here oh, on your oh, photographer actually, slide? Yes, oh, so this is actually um, a portrait uh, that was done um, in collaboration with this amazing uh, 
uh, exhibition at the Grounds for Sculpture Museum, actually on the, on the left. And then this is uh, the memorial at the International African American Museum down in Charleston, uh, which I recently photographed. Um, but so coming back full circle, um, I was encouraged by my agency that I work with, Esto Photographics, to do a run through of some of the pieces to really just kind of get my head in the game and see if I have all of the tools necessary to just jump right back into this uh, world of photographing fine art. And they also suggested that I work with a lighting specialist um, that would just make everything run so much more smoothly and efficiently. And so I talked to Ed De Joseph. That was he was extremely well recommended um, by many collaborators, and we had never worked together before. So I was like, okay, we have to just test it out. <laughs> so that was the that was what the test day was. And I also brought on um, a former colleague of mine that I worked with at the PMA, Lynn Rosenthal who worked as a consultant, um, and she has decades and decades of, of experience working on photographing many different size sculptures, materials of sculpture at the PMA. And um, what one thing that I really appreciated about Lynn, and this is something that you mentioned, is that she, every time a piece was put in front of her, she asked you what the title was. I don't know if you remember that. I do. Um, <laughs> and that was, you know, so she could just, like, very quickly, because this is a very fast-paced, um, you know, uh, effort, very quickly understand what, you know, the, the emphasis behind the piece is. Or, or, you know, of course the title's not going to tell you everything that you need to know, but it, it, in addition to, like, looking at the piece and observing it and walking around, understanding what the artist decided to, to title it. And that was something that I really quickly learned and picked up from her because previously I was just thinking, I was working more internally and feeling, you know, kind of trying to understand how I felt about the piece and like how I thought it should be photographed. And, and um, so she really helped to shift my process there as well. Yeah. And Ed, I'd love to hear more from you about what, what that test photography shoot was like for you and thinking about all of the lighting work that you've done previously that you brought right. to this project, which is a little different than Absolutely. the projects um, we talked about you working on in the past. As you can see, a few of them. It's like uh, I do some uh, product work, tabletop work. Uh, was really interesting in my early conversations with Sahar was... Um, uh, the role of the background behind the sculptures and uh, the, the sizing of the lenses, uh, all of those things. And I just want, I want to piggyback as well, uh, something I found as just to be a different perspective was Lynn's asking, uh, what is the name of this and that perspective? Because I certainly generally would approach something, especially if it's a face or a person or something that is in the shape of a human of like, okay, well, this is how you light a face. Yep. And Lynn had a, quite an opposite uh, approach to that thing, like, no, this isn't a person, this is a piece of art. And we need to think of it in those terms. And I, I found that to be uh, really useful. Yeah, and I wonder, um, you know, I learned a lot on that first test shoot also. <laughs> um, I think that... Folks who know spaces at PAFA might be encouraged to know that uh, there isn't actually a photography studio on site that is set up for medium to large scale sculpture. Um, so one of the things that we were testing out the first time we were thinking about how to photograph all of this work for the catalog is where, do, where does this happen? what's necessary for it to happen, how does it happen. Um, and we actually worked out of two different classrooms on site. And so part of what um, I want to go back to this um, first slide is uh, making sure everyone understands. So this is happening in a classroom. Um, we, attempt, we essentially squatted in these spaces <laughs> when the uh, students and faculty weren't working in them. And Sahar and Ed set up a photo studio just for the purposes of this shoot. So I thought it would be good for us to talk about equipment. What does it look like? You know, once you, when you have the catalog in your hands, you imagine that there's a complicated production studio behind the scenes. And when there isn't one, I think that it's amazing to have 
two technicians who are both brilliant artists um, coming to work on another artist's work, but also who have to figure out if there is no space, how do you how do you build the kitchen so that you can cook the meal? Yeah. Um, and I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about equipment, what, what you brought in, what you learned that you needed, what you didn't realize that you would need, how did you... How did that come together? Yeah, yeah uh, well, I was pretty frightened when I first heard that there was no dedicated studio. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> to, to I mean, I knew that going in. Um, but, but at the same time, I am very well versed and I have experience in creating, you know, photographing on set um, um, in spaces, especially portraits. You know, you're going to people's houses potentially um, and you're creating. Uh, the background and the light that you want. So I knew that we had to create a well-working studio, which is one of the main reasons that Ed was the perfect fit for this. Um, but if we're to get a little bit techy, it's not. It's a fairly, fairly simple mm -hmm. setup. Um, yeah. So uh, I used a medium format camera. I knew that you know these a lot of these images were going to need to be blown up pretty big. Um, and so we needed a very large sensor and I, my typical kit is a Canon uh, DSR, which is fairly large, but we need, well, I needed a much bigger sensor. So we went with a medium format, um, a simple tripod. We used Adrian, I, I'm not remembering his last name. Adrian Kubias. Kubias, yes. Fantastic photographer here. We uh, borrowed a couple pieces of his equipment. He let us. He lent lent them to us. Um, one fantastic tripod that actually has um, an adapter that has wheels, so you can make this like millimeter shift to change your angle just ever so slightly. So that was fantastic. We also tethered to uh, the laptop so that Brittany could approve all of the images as they were being fed directly from the camera to to the laptop. Um, a few lenses, um, a wide angle, because there are 12 foot tall pieces that we needed to photograph. And then there are very much smaller pieces. So then a 32 to, sorry, 32 to 64 millimeter lens, if that means anything to you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we had a seamless background and we had tons of, um, CS stands, C stands. Um, Ed, you go into your lighting. Yes. Uh, um. Yeah, because a, there are a few. Um, I remember thinking this this is an incredible setup um, to get images like this. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the. I mean, thinking about you know what's the setup required to get images like this. Absolutely. Um, and you were thinking really Sounds deeply different. about lighting and. Yeah, and if we could go back a couple slides yeah. uh, to, or one more from here, I think. Yeah, to this one. Um, yeah. A lot of the time when interacting with a, a larger object, um, you, you, the light needs to generally be soft for it to spread evenly across the subject for it to look hmm. pleasant. Um, and so as you see here, we are uh, kind of hitting it with lights and soft boxes. And the black grid thing is it's called a, an, an egg crate. And it kind of controls and gives the really soft light some directionality. And, you know, generally I was talking before about it's like, oh, it's like, this is a, let's call it, say, a humanoid thing. It'll, it'll take light like, a, like you would light a person. And so, but as you see, it's, it's pretty reflective. Now, I get, I'd say there's like a, a gamut of reflectivity. This is probably on the lower end of it compared to some of the the other pieces we worked with. Um, and so and this, is, in a way, was like an, an early version of kind of how we approached a lot of these pieces. Um, something else I'd call attention to, though, is, and just to like emphasize it is, so when we, normally if I work in a studio, like uh, Sahar, I would normally uh, use, the paper would be larger, or we'd shoot on a painted background, where it's like there's a whole wall right, in the space, and they paint it the color, yeah. and then you just light it. And as you see here, I'm doing kind of a, I'll say commercialized thing, where if, as you see there's a source above the paper just to kind of light it evenly so it's a solid thing. Something we kind of cultivated throughout it is we ended up using one to three, so, so, sometimes a fourth light, hitting the background from different angles to create gradients and other things um, that you'll see later on. And I would suppose if, if we have a... 
couple further up. Yeah. Later on, we made um, our key light even bigger and softer, specifically when we got to uh, the larger pieces in the bigger room, um, just because as the pieces grew, so did uh, the width of our source. And, and for some of them, like if it were here, as you see, um, the light is not in a soft box. It's on the right of the, the frame there. It's pointed into a bounce. Mm -hmm. And so what we kind of discovered with that was for some of the larger pieces, especially these made of the, the teak or which, whichever wood, very reflected. It's a chiseled kind of beveled surface. There's a million little points of reflection all over every inch of it. And we don't want to feel that on every little millimeter of each thing. And so, as you see, it's still a little reflective because it's the nature of the beast. But um, by doing that technique where we take the light and bounce it, and then it goes through a diffusion as well, we really minimize a lot of the hot spots so that you have like a nice, even uh, look to it, as you see. And then, and then you have to also, it's, um, it's a balance too because there is the point where you could diffuse the light too much so that you don't understand what the material is when you're looking at it. So you yeah. really have to be able to bring out the to, material. To find that balance. Yeah, yeah. as well. Um, and I suppose then the, uh, but then the other piece of it is, as you see, there's the uh, black thing uh, next to the light there in the image. We have to... We used flags, uh, solid flags, to um, contain the light to an extent, because even though we want it to be a wide source, we don't want it to eat up everything that's happening on the background with the other lights. Mm -hmm. So then, so it's, uh, on a movie set, we'd call it a grip forest, where there's uh, two or three flags controlling a bounce and a diffusion. It's a whole, it's like a bunch of trees all around the lights. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. I never heard that term before. <laughs> no, I really enjoyed all of your jargon. Uh, <laughs> I feel like every time you had a name for something, I thought, ooh, what is that? <laughs> you know, it's this whole other language around um, the technicality of producing these images. Um, and this is actually in a space where I remember what was uh, amazing to um, me and Han both running around this giant room is that um, there are windows all along one side of the walls. Um, and so the first thing uh, about setting up this space was figuring out how to either seal all the windows or control for the fact that the light was going to change over the course of the day um, as the sun rises and falls in this space. And so what would it mean for the camera and lighting and, and you know, just the setup of all of the equipment to have to progressively track the day if you wanted to use the natural light to yeah. um, photograph all the sculpture. Yeah, that was an early decision. At first, we were like, yeah. well, could we use the sun <laughs> as our natural light source in this room? And immediately we were like, absolutely, absolutely not. Like no, nope. we're gonna... a frightening <laughs> continuity issue. <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> not. It's set up. Yeah, no, like you said, as it changes throughout the day, you really have to have a controlled environment. Abs you know, we have to control the light as much as possible because not only will the, the um, feel and the atmosphere of the light like change it's also the temperature the color temperature will, will change throughout the day and that would be a nightmare <laughs> and you can kind of see it in this slide um we yeah. ended up um uh, clipping up some uh muslin material and then also duvetyn to the windows so that uh, no natural light was or you know very minimal natural light was able to get through um to the pieces could you talk about what was maybe the most fun or the most challenging to work on? Um, yeah, either for this shoot, uh, and we don't have to talk about the day the freight elevator we had on us. <laughs> um, yeah, I forgot about that challenge. Yeah. Um, so I could start with a challenge, though. I think that, and this is probably a little bit different, it's not tech related really, um, mm -hmm. but patience. Um, I did not account for all of the behind the scenes that you were doing. You were doing such an amazing, incredible job orchestrating everything for the exhibition. And I did not, for instance, um, account for conservation. And, and so I'm a, 
a planner and I and I looked at the checklist of all of the pieces and I said, oh, we've got all of this wood at this size. Great, we'll do it all in this day or this two days yeah. in this room. And then we'll do all of the bronze here and these sizes. And I had this great elaborate plan. Mm -hmm. And then Brittany said, well, actually that is still in conservation or we need to switch. So, so just, you know, pivoting, um, which just comes along with everything that you're doing in life. So that was a little bit of a challenge for me right away. Um, but, you know, we, we, we kind of worked that out and we got, um, especially towards the end of, of uh, working on these pieces, we, we had a great list and we knew what was coming when, and I realized that I really also needed the conservation so that the piece was as clean and pristine and beautiful <laughs> when we were going to photograph it as well. Um, do you want to talk about challenges but before I talk about what's fun and interesting? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I would say um, the one of the elements of doing this that just has basically nothing in common with like I would say what I normally do is um, working with the art handler team. And that is a gigantic part of the scheduling and the planning right. as well because for some of the pieces they need to, we had a picture of it a second ago, yeah. there, there was this um, pulley crane system that they had to specially bring in for one day or um, it'd be like, we have to schedule all of the pieces that require four people to lift them for this day, and and just even um, thinking about that and you know cohabitating the space and getting everybody in and out. Like to me, that was, um, I guess, let's say a non-lighting challenge that I wasn't <laughs> anticipating. This, um, and I would just say too, it's a uh, a lot of the time if I light something like let's say for the tabletop, the smaller things, it's um, a whiskey bottle or a iced coffee or a sandwich <laughs> and just the the treatment of the detail you know it, a, the notes are not as much about, about this is our best knowledge of what the artist intended for this piece to look like it's client says more light on the lettuce <laughs> and, and, and we're, okay turn up the light on the lettuce <laughs> and, that, and so just uh, kind of parsing that all out was um it was, it was challenging, but it was really rewarding at the same time. So. Yeah, I think that, so that's like one of the, uh, a note for like fun and interesting. I think the collaboration piece was great. It was great working with you and you like really being invested and, and um, wanting to sign off on the pieces as they would go was, was fantastic. You don't have to say that just because. <laughs> no, it was because, you know, it helped me. A lot of times you would push it back on me. So there was this little dance that we did. Every time a piece, every time a piece came, I would say, Brittany, do you have an idea of how you want this to be photographed? And occasionally you would say from here, here, and here. But more typically, you would say, I want the piece to determine how it should be photographed. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, wow, that's a lot of pressure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly all the memes about why people hate our curators. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I would go to Ed and I was like, what do, we, what do we want this to look like? How should we light this? And we had a very good idea about where where we were going to start like with the book light for the yeah. uh, for the bronze or you know like we had a good system in place on where we got started but then when we got into the meat of it there were tons yeah. of tweaks of course that we had to do here here and here for all of the different and, and even like another thing is um i had to kind of break my brain out of is like if we're say we're filming a dialogue scene in a movie we shoot the wide and then we go in for the close-ups the lighting has to feel like it's all coming from the same, is you establish a scene. Mm -hmm. And, but when we're filming a piece on a background, it's not, have, it's not talking to the neighbor across the street in the shot. It, it, it's, each image is real, or much more so its own thing. And there's, so, so even like, I kind of had to like, it's like, no, like it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense for the light to come from that side for this shot because of the way it's shaped. So you need to stop trying to make that happen and make it work. Like, yeah. like in uh, this one, the, the, the key light flips. Um, between, yeah. or it's, it's a kind of the, where we feel more light from the other side right. when we get to one particular shot, which normally like, you, know, you can't do that. But, right. and but for this, you have to, and, it, and it's good. Troubleshooting, but, yeah, because yeah. it just did not, it was not 
it was not working on that same side. Yeah. <laughs> when you flip it, it's completely, it's completely different. Um, yeah, and so I, I wanted everyone on, on the set to just be happy with, with the images. I mean, and the art handlers as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even for the crucifixion, um, the art handlers were great collaboration, well, great collaborators because I remember, I think it was Clace Gabriel who mm -hmm. um, really helped figure out how we were going to hang this because, mm -hmm. because you know, you saw it in the, in the exhibition and how you, we couldn't lay it flat. Um, you know, so we had to really uh, understand, you know, how to nail, put it, put nails into the wall so that we could, we could hang it. And then do we, do we use a seamless on the back or do we just put it on the wall and, and, and have it go white? So everyone really helped um, a, a, and for a, most of these pieces. Yeah, and I do want to um, open it up to Q&A, so get your questions ready. But before we get there, um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about photo editing. Um, right. I think this is the part of the process that, that people don't see. Um, and I, I want to, you know, full disclosure, we didn't go in completely blind. We, you did ask me for a lookbook when we first started talking about um, this project, which I think... Um, was really helpful. Uh, I I think it's the first time a photographer ever gave me homework. I forgot um, that I did that. And it was really <laughs> and it was really excellent um, homework because it meant that when we were talking about how to how to think about lighting, how to think about positioning um, before we got to this point, um, I had already you know we had a conversation where we talked to through slides where I thought. Um, oh, I would like this to look like Arms and Armor at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in the catalog, or I would like this to look like um, jewelry at a Christie's auction. <laughs> there was a way that we were talking about what the treatments could look like for different media. Um, and because sculpture is three-dimensional, there are an infinite number of ways that it could look in the catalog, both in terms of where the camera is physically, um, distance, height from the object um, and also just positioning or different views. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about sure. um, handling and handling and editing. How much time do we have? Um, we have five minutes and then we're going to open it up. Okay. Okay. So I can go pretty quickly. Um, so for, for editing some of the pieces, we, I, we had to think in those terms, or I specifically was thinking in those terms. I wanted everything to be um, as done as possible in frame. I mean, that's usually the photographer's goal, um, but certainly here, um, because it would be hours and hours of editing uh, later. And I did have somebody come out, come help with like the very last touches um, of the seamless and things like that, but I knew that there was gonna be a significant amount of post-processing anyway. Um, but so you see that, you know, when we photographed occasionally for some of the pieces, um, we couldn't put the piece directly on the seamless, which is a little bit more difficult because you have to then create some sort of, um, you know, uh, shadow underneath. Um, and so that was, that's a little bit more of a challenge. So, I mean, that's one thing that, you know, is like a behind the scenes, you don't really see very much. Uh, there were some things that I just, you know, some interventions um, <laughs> here, here. Um, this, this piece, the large abstract female figure was, um, it was nailed on this board and it couldn't be moved yet or we didn't have the art handlers for it. I'm not sure exactly what it was. And, I, and that was, I think I was a little bit like perturbed at that point. And I was like, okay, well, you know what we could do? Why don't we just make the base gray so that it'll be, you know, it'll just take maybe five minutes off of my life later, you know? <laughs> um, and then, so I just, I'm going to run through really fast. Yeah. Um, just a few like, um, uh, side by side images so that you can see how the lighting progressed like through one or two pieces. Um, so the monumental, th this is what Ed meant when he was when he was talking about we would have to control for the light in the room. So this is the muslin that we, we hung. So, um, so you can see here, um, this is the final monumental reclining, female nude with three heads. This is the final that's in, in the book. Um, but this is where we started. Wow. Um, so you can see that this is this is with the book light so far. We're starting yeah. with just just I think there's only one light 
um, that's on the right um, yeah. of the image right here. And then this is introducing another light. And so when you introduce another light, it changes everything. <laughs> it changes what the first light is doing. So there were often times where I said, okay, now turn this light off and let's just look and see what this light is doing. Um, you also see the Macbeth card here, and that is to, to control for the color temperature um, in the final in the final image, just to make sure that the color of the piece is correct um, for the light. We brought in two background lights, yeah. generally speaking, generally speaking from the right of the, of the yeah. piece, um, to have this really beautiful, nice shadow across the ground plane. Mm -hmm. um, you don't t typically want, unless you're just doing, you know, Art documentation, which I shouldn't say, just is fantastic work. Um, but you, you, you don't typically want to have the shadow cast on the seamless. You want the shadow to come through on the ground plane. So this was was the background light, and then this is a really beautiful light that's highlighting the the nape of the neck there as well. Um, yeah. It was a little too much, so maybe we turned it down. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we have to introduce the light, of course, on the background because it was just it's too flat. Um, and so introducing the light on the background um, and then mm, turning all those lights back on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you want to say something? As I was saying, yeah, that looks like we introduced, um, I can't tell if it's a, just a bounce from the front or if it was a bounce into the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Looks like was introduced here. And if you actually look at the leg, Lynn was here for this shoot as well, and if you, you see the difference between these two images, mm -hmm. um, I was having a hard time with the, the light not stretching across her leg, and, and, and you really want to be able to show all of the curves and in a really beautiful, beautiful, um, soft way, especially when you have pieces um, that are, you know, I don't, you would know how to say it better than me, but that are, you know, really, so all of these curves and it's so soft and, and the material that he used, you know, you, you really want to um, play that up with the light as much as possible. Yeah, I feel like I remember, um, I kept sort of reiterating like, no, I need the viewer to understand on the page what John is doing in 3D and that, like translation from three dimensional to two dimensional was such a huge part of our conversation around what light is where and what the temperature is and all of these places where you were like, it's running a little hot. And I was like, I like it hot. And then we could, <laughs> <laughs> like developing our own language around the, like, no, you don't think that's too reflective? No, like the reflection is the point. Yeah. <laughs> what a jewelry. Yeah. No, I did. <laughs> Um, and so this, you could just see the, the final setup here. And I, we won't talk too much about this because the next panelist will, will talk about um, the slave ship in a different way, not speaking about the photography, of course. But um, this was a very, this is a, a departure in his work. Um, but it was also, you know, when we first looked at photographing this, we were like, this is very different. And how do we approach this? And, and how do we pay homage to um, the content of the yeah. piece? with the light and the photography, it's obviously much more somber. We wanted to approach it to be a little bit more contrasty, to really kind of you know, get across the content of the piece and, and all of the figures and everything. So I'll just kind of run through pretty quickly mm -hmm. so that there's question and answer, but just so that you can see um, all of the process that, that went through. Yeah. And photographing it um, as an aerial, we didn't do that before. Actually, photographed mm -hmm. straight down. No. So you know, this was very important, and you can see how there were so many different <laughs> types of lighting. Really understanding, and this is the final, but understanding that you know we had to get light through all of the layers of the figures yeah. um, throughout. There were maybe four, three, three or four layers, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then and then. You know, Brittany also mentioned that she was thinking that it, it also resembled a cowrie shell if you're looking straight down. So that was very important. All of these views and, and, and everything really, that's why I said the collaboration really, it, it was incredible because I wouldn't have approached photographing this piece in this way had it not been for you to say that. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you guys. Here's the first question. So my question is, um, I, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the difference between like photography for the sake of documenting something and the photography that you were doing, which is much more stylized. 
uh, also behind the scenes, Brittany's my partner, so when she was talking to me about this in the beginning, I told her when she was like making a lookbook to think about, because I'm also a photographer, but I'm not as good as Sahar. Uh, <laughs> I told her to think about like instead of just what the lights are doing, what the shadows are doing, right? So that sort of got Britney's wheels turning for, you know, for the the lookbook. Um, but I think people who aren't photographers might not get that what that difference is between documenting something and what you were doing for the the book, and it's an important distinction. Um, that yeah, that is an important distinction. So I think I mean some of it is just from the the training that I had at, at the PMA um, and so it's just kind of like um, looking through so many exhibition catalogs and working on them I mean hours and hours of, of photo retouching for specific catalogs <laughs> um, and understanding that you know a viewer has a much different reaction to the documentation piece or the documentation photography and so the documentation photography is really to just photograph an extensive catalog um, for archiving sake and it's just it's literally so that you understand like this is this is what this piece is um, and it is not uh, necessarily it can be artistic but it is not it, that is not at the forefront of your mind you really want to make sure that you are photographing in a way where you understand the material at materiality of the piece um, and that you get all of the the most important angles of the piece for the curators, right? So that you can understand what the piece is saying. Um, now for an exhibition catalog, it is so much more open to interpretation. Um, and so that's why it is important, I think, to work with um, the, the curators um, or at least have an understanding of what they're looking for, which is why, I guess, see, I didn't even remember that I said this, I was looking for a lookbook from her. Um, but then we worked side by side. Um, and so that's also why, I mean, we just talked about all of this extensive lighting and all of these different, um, you know, decisions that we had to make. All of the details, that was one thing that I found so fun and interesting. I love photographing the details and Rodin, Rodin he um, signed his name so, so much in the pieces and I found the signatures to be fascinating. And um, so we, Brittany and I would walk around the piece after it was placed by the art handlers and find so many details or different angles that we wanted to photograph, we you know had to narrow them down. But there, were, there, were, you know, there's endless you know possibilities of how you can approach and, and light, and you really have to you know go in with a plan, try to stick to the plan as much as possible, and make all of these decisions, and hire an amazing expert lighting designer <laughs> <laughs> that can help you with that. Thank you. Um, it, like oh. I can't resist because they're so good. Okay, let's ask one more question. Um, because you are in such a tight space, um, I was wondering what was the widest angle lens you had to use in order to get in the bigger sculptures without distortion? Well, so the actually, the we were in a pretty large space for the taller pieces, for the 12 feet pieces. And so I think I only used a 64 millimeter there which is not so wide, but I did bring a 20 to 35 because I was afraid that I would have to get wider. I, of course, wouldn't go all the way to 20, but I was thinking that I might have to go to 35 millimeters, which is a little bit different. I don't know if you're typically using, so for Fuji, it's a little bit, this is a Fuji camera, it's a little bit different than, um, you know, a Nikon or a Pentax. I think in that case, what is it, like 10 millimeters difference? I don't know, you would know, you're more techie than me. Mm -hmm. I think it would be um, something like 30, 30 millimeters, something like that. Thank you very much. And, and again, let's give our panel a round of applause. <laughs>